Uh, we are continuing our study of the book of Matthew. Last week we saw that Matthew, although it's the first book in the Bible, it is actually the second of the Gospels that was written. It's one of three synoptic Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The three of them are called synoptic because it means to oversee. They see the same thing. So you have the word optic in the Greek. Um, and we talked last week about Jesus and the fact that Jesus coming and fulfilling um, what Matthew says about prophecy was actually um, a Hebrew word called lakim, and it meant to perform or redo. And so Jesus is, in essence, redoing the nation of Israel's history. And so I got some feedback from some people, and they said that was a little confusing, and I can understand that. And so I want to just spend a little bit more time just kind of clarifying what that means. If, if you remember in Old Testament scripture, Israel is called God's servant. And we see this in numerous passages. We see this in Isaiah. We see it in Jeremiah. We see it in Hosea, where God calls them his servant. And it's interesting because Israel at one time, the nation of Israel, they were enslaved to the Egyptians but when God calls them out, they become servants to him. And so we know that Jesus is also called God's servant. He calls himself that numerous times, specifically in the book of John. So here's the question. How would people know that the Messiah had come? How would you know? Well, they had to use the Old Testament backdrop. They had to use what the Old Testament said about the Messiah who was going to come to this earth, they had to use that to establish who the Messiah was. And the genius of God and the genius of, of how he puts things together, Jesus is a redo of everything that happened with Israel. And we're going to see another example of that as we get into Matthew chapter 2. I hope that you read chapter 2 and chapter 3. I don't know if we're going to get through chapter 3 tonight. But at the beginning of Matthew chapter 2, we see that the wise men show up. And when the wise men come, they come to Herod and they say, Hey, where is the king of the Jews? And it says in Scripture that Herod and the people in Jerusalem, that they were troubled. Now, why would you be troubled if somebody asked you, Where is the king of the Jews? Well, the problem is, is that Herod felt threatened by that. And we're going to talk a little bit about Herod here in this, uh, in this study tonight. But Herod was a trippy dude, and he felt threatened. And it says that the people were troubled also. And I think one of the reasons that the people were troubled is because they did not know what to expect from Herod over this news. Because Herod was very brutal. He was very mean. He was very nasty to the people of Israel. So these wise men show up. They ask him about the Christ king that's been born. And Herod says, hey, do me a favor. When you find him, let me know, because I want to come and worship him. Well, we know Herod didn't want to worship him. Herod wanted to kill him. So the wise men, they go, they follow the star. Matthew tells us they follow a star. Luke tells us that they follow a star. And it says that finally they come upon the home of Mary. So what do we see with that picture? The wise men coming to the home of Mary. Well, the Christmas story isn't true. We see Jesus in a manger and we see the wise men coming and bringing their gifts but actually, the wise men bring the gifts to Jesus when Mary is in her home. And so Jesus was between one to two years old when the wise men show up to honor him and bring him gifts. Here's the crazy thing. These wise men who had traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles to come and worship this, this Christ King, they came to bring him honor and glory and praise. Herod, on the other hand, being troubled, wanted to kill him. Charles Spurgeon said something interesting about this. He says, this trouble is again testimony to the greatness of Jesus. Even as a young child, Jesus of Nazareth is so potent a factor in the world 
of mind that no sooner is he here in his utmost weakness as a baby, a newborn king, that he begins to reign. Before he mounts the throne, friends bring him presents, and his enemies encompass his death. Even as a child, even as a baby, one or two years old, Jesus already had enemies. He already had somebody that was trying to kill him. So let's go to Matthew. Let's see what happened here. Chapter 2, verse 13. Here's going to be a couple of redos that we're going to look at. It says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. So God comes and speaks to Joseph in a dream and says, hey, take him to Egypt, right? Take him. He needs to go. This is where he's going to be safe. Here's the redo. If you remember in the book of Genesis, Israel fled to Egypt to escape the famine, right? Jesus, right, he fled to Egypt to escape Herod. So in a sense, Egypt is a safe haven for the nation of Israel, and it was a safe haven for Jesus. And they remained there until Herod's death. Then Matthew writes, this was to fulfill, Lachim, what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, this, this quote actually comes out of the book of Hosea. It's Hosea 11.1. 1. And it reads, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So the prophet Hosea, when he pens this, he is actually remembering when God, over 500 years earlier, had took Egypt from slavery into freedom. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to verse 20. Now, let's go into another segment here, and then we're going to tie this all together. If you go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, it says, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Who is this? We're talking about the wise men. The wise men had went, they had visited Mary, and they had a dream also that was from the Lord, that they were to depart their country, but go another way. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So Herod goes berserk. And it says here that he killed all the male children in Bethlehem. All of them. Two years and younger, he kills them. But the wise men. We can learn something from the wise men. These men earnestly sought the Christ child. They earnestly sought him. Scholars think that their journey could have been over two, at least two years, right? Maybe longer because they started traveling to the place where they thought they were going to find this Christ child. They're not sure exactly how long the journey was, but they had traveled for some time. These men earnestly sought the Christ child, and God honored them and protected them because of that. Church, listen. When we seek Jesus, God does the same. 
When we seek out the Lord, when we earnestly seek out God, God will honor us and he'll protect us. He'll shield us. He'll do the miraculous in us. The wise men are a beautiful picture of what we should be doing, searching, seeking, until we finally find Jesus, till we finally get to the destination and finding the Christ child. And the Christ child is at the center of your heart. See, sometimes I think that Christ isn't at the center. Sometimes I think we're, we're still outside knocking on the door trying to get into where the Christ child is at. But no, Jesus Jesus wants to take center stage. He wants to be at the center of your heart and your mind. Now, who's this guy, Herod? Herod's all throughout chapter 2. Well, Herod's a trippy dude, like I said. He's actually called Herod the Great. And the reason he's called Herod the Great because he did do a lot of great things. He was singly, or how should I say? I'll just say it. He was, the, he was responsible I was going to try to use a big word, but too big for me. He was responsible for the second temple being what it was. So the second temple was constructed when the Israelites came back out of Babylonian captivity. When they came back out of captivity, then the second temple was built. Why? Because the first temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. So the second temple, it, it was a beautiful work of art. It was incredible. It was gorgeous. It was huge. And Herod was, was instrumental in getting that done. He was a fantastic politician. He knew how to wheel and deal and how to get things done for the city of Jerusalem. But here's the problem. Herod was a puppet king who had been installed by Rome. And because he was born in Edom, he was an Edomite, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a Jew, the Jews viewed him as an illegitimate ruler and never trusted him. And Herod wanted power, and he would do anything to have power. And so he was very brutal to keep his power. He would have people whacked all the time. I mean, he was like a mafia, Don or something. I mean, he would just have people, just they, just, they would just disappear. And so upon hearing of the Christ child, that this was the king of the Jews, that this was the promised Messiah, Herod's mind twisted and he wanted to kill Christ. But that thought didn't last too long because about six months after he had made this edict, he dies. God takes him out. Matthew chapter 2, verse 19 says this, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So again, do you see kind of a common theme here in, in, cha in chapter 2? I do. Dreams. Dreams. Church, God speaks through dreams. He speaks through dreams. Some of you have the gift of interpretation of dreams. And it's an incredible gift. And, and we should never forget that God will speak to us through dreams. But I think sometimes we blow it off because we can't think that it's from God. But listen, if God did it then, God does it now. There are times when God speaks to me in dreams. And I don't dream. So when I dream, I go, okay, God, that must be you, right? I don't, I don't sleep like that. Listen, don't blow off your dreams. God may be telling you something. Seek it out. Search it out. Ask God for clarity. Could be nothing, but double check. Could be something from the enemy, but double check. Maybe God wants to tell you something. So Joseph has a dream. 
And God says, take the child and go to Israel. Take the child and go to Israel. Now, we're not sure what the period of time is here, but we think it was probably, Jesus was probably about four or five years old. So he probably spent at least three years, maybe more, uh, in uh, Egypt. Here's what I want you to take away from this. It's important not to move until God says so. Joseph did not move until God told him. And God came to a dream and told him, we grow impatient. So many times we grow impatient, man. I know I do. God does not move quick enough for me sometimes. Why is God not doing something? Why is God not making this happen? Why isn't God doing this? Well, sometimes it's because it's what I want to happen. But sometimes he's waiting. And in this instance, he was waiting for Herod to die. Right? God knows everything. God is sovereign. He knew when Herod was going to take his last breath. And when Herod dies, then he says, now you can leave and go. Don't grow impatient. I don't know what your circumstances are, but don't get impatient with your circumstances, man. Don't make decisions on emotion. You will kill yourself if you make decisions on emotion. Yes, sometimes things are tough. Sometimes things are hard. But you cannot let your emotions wipe you out, take you out, because you may get yourself into a situation you should not be in. Joseph stayed fast. He didn't get emotional. He didn't get worried. He just stayed where he was told to stay, and he waited on the Lord. And church, that's what we need to do also. That's what we need to do. So now, as Joseph takes Jesus out of Egypt, back to, back to Israel, now we see the second part of what we read earlier, that out of, G, out of Egypt I've called my son. Like Israel, who had been a captive in Egypt and then released. Jesus was held captive in Egypt and released when Herod died. Sometimes God has you captive because he's trying to protect you. He's trying to keep you from harm or for something worse happening to you. And God, why are you being so restrictive? Because I have to, because if I'm not, something could happen to you. you got to trust the Lord. Now, in the passage of Scripture we just read, we see this guy, Archelaus, right? Who is this guy? Well, this is Herod's son, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He was just like his dad. Josephus tells us that Archelaus was as cruel as his father, Herod the Great, but without any greatness, Right? <laughs> That's kind of, <laughs> what a title, right? Without any greatness. A man of kindred nature, suspicious, truculent, to be feared and avoided, just like his father. Except he wasn't great, and he wasn't. His reign lasted two years, and he was gone. But because of this guy, Joseph had reservations. Joseph's like, I don't know, man. I know this dude is like his dad, and I don't know, if we go, is he going to try to destroy my son? And so what does God do? God doesn't leave him hanging, church. God comes to him in a dream again. He says, hey, don't sweat it, guy. I know your fears. Here's what I need to do. Church, what's the lesson we can learn from this? Patience. Right. Patience. Again, be patient. You have to be patient. God will, God will bring the answer to you. But sometimes it's, you have to learn some lessons of patience and waiting and perseverance. We're called to persevere, right? I can't tell you how many situations I've been where I had to persevere. I can't tell you how many jobs I've had where I had to persevere. That I had to. I had to take care of my family. I had to work through it. I had to push through it. Guys, wait on the Lord. He will bring the answer to you. And so Joseph, what does it say he does? He goes to the district of Galilee. Galilee was a district. We sometimes seem to think that Galilee was maybe a city. It's not. The Galilean was a region. It was a region, okay? And in the district of Galilee, he was going to go to Nazareth. Now, here's what's interesting about this. 
Matthew says that this was to fulfill a prophecy of Jesus being from Nazareth or a Nazareth. Now, some people think it's because Jesus was going to take a Nazarite vow, right? Because the, the word in the Hebrew, Nasser, is close to, to Nazar for Nazarite, right? But I don't think that's what was going on here. I think Matthew was referring to an idea, and I think he was referring more specifically to an idea that is in a verse in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 tells us this. There shall come from forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, the Hebrew word translated for branch, very interesting, is almost like the same word for Nazareth or Nazarene or Nazarite, it's also Nasser. Nasser. So here's what it is. Jewish scholars believe the reference to be mainly to Isaiah 11, where mention is made of the branch that shall bring forth uh, out of Jesse's shoot. In other words, Nazarene means this, that Jesus was the man of Nazareth, the town of a little shoot. What does that mean? It's symbolic of who Jesus is. Nazareth was a very unremarkable town. Nothing happened good in Nazareth, right? Nothing happened good in Nazareth. And Jesus being from Nazareth, this lowly, despised, despicable place, it totally fit who Jesus was. Jesus was lowly and humble and despised. He was despised. And this is where Jesus grew up. This is where Jesus' roots were at. Jesus wasn't in, you know, the Taj Mahal of cities growing up. He wasn't like Moses who grew up in, in Pharaoh's uh, palace. No, Jesus grew up almost like a, like a street kid. He didn't have anything. And so this place, Nazareth, is going to be something that is going to be placed with Jesus' name numerous times as we go through the book of Matthew and some of the other synoptic gospels. We'll go a little further. Chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. So now we go from Jesus as a child, a young child, going to Nazareth. And now we're not going to really see anything on Jesus for about another six or seven years. He's going to show up again at the temple with his parents, and we see this in Luke. But now we have this guy, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is an interesting character. Does anybody know who John the Baptist was? Jesus' cousin, exactly. He was Jesus' cousin. Six months before Jesus was born, there was an event that happened between John's mother and Jesus' mom, Mary. If you go to Luke chapter 1, verse 39, it reads, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped with joy. 
Wow. The connection between John the Baptist and Jesus was already in the womb. God had already preordained it. Listen, if there's any doubt that God has preordained your life when, when you've come to Jesus, this is it. They weren't even born. And the two knew each other, man. There was going to be an incredible bond between them. John was the guy. This was Jesus' dude, man. This was Jesus' mouthpiece who was going to proclaim his coming, who was going to proclaim who he was, who was going to set forth the path and make it straight for our Lord. Verse 3 says, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness. This actually comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah was the prophet crying in the wilderness at the time when this was written in Isaiah. And what was he crying? Well, in chapter 39... He had been predicting the Babylonians coming and destroying Jerusalem, destroying the temple, taking everybody captive, leaving nothing, nothing left. I mean, they were going to take it down to the very rubble, to the very ground. But in chapter 40, after God makes this proclamation through the uh, prophet Isaiah, in chapter 40, God begins to announce that they will be coming back. That they'll be coming back. And so Isaiah is the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He was telling the nation of Israel, get ready. The Lord is going to bring you back. Prepare the way. God's bringing you back. You're going to come out of captivity. Listen, church, some of you are in captivity right now. Some of you are being held down. Some of you are being held back. I'm telling you right now, God is preparing a way for you to be released. But you've got to seek him, man. You've got to seek him. So John the Baptist, in being described by Matthew, is described like Isaiah as one in the wilderness. Where was his ministry at? Exactly, he was in the wilderness. His ministry wasn't inside the city. His ministry was outside the city. And people would come out to wherever he was at and listen to what he had to say. And his message was always the same. Repent for the kingdom of, of God is at hand. Right? He's at hand. Now, there's two sides to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, in a sense, a prophet like Isaiah, proclaiming that the Lord is going to do a work. He's also like the prophet Elijah. Why do you say that? Because the same description of John here is the same description of Elijah. Elijah, was, <laughs> he was just like John. He, he, he wore this big belt, right? He ate locusts, he ate honey. So John the Baptist, right, is a representation of Elijah. And Elijah, his ministry was calling the nation of Israel to repentance. Does anybody remember the battle that Elijah had? Do you remember what that battle was? So Elijah called out 450 of the prophets of, of Baal. He calls them out. He says, hey, we're going to have it out today, boys. We're going to see who's who. We're going to show the nation who's really who. And so what does he do? He takes them up to the top of the mountain. And he says, you know what? We're going to build an altar, man. You build your altar, I'm going to build mine. He says, and we're going to lay an animal on that altar, and your God is going to catch it on fire. So he says, you guys go first. So they build their altar and everything, man, and, and they're, they're getting everything set up. Boy, they lay, they lay the animal down. They start crying out to their gods and crying out to the gods, and nothing happened. And so this goes on from like 8 in the morning till noon. So at noontime, what does is, what is, uh, Elijah start doing? He starts mocking them. Hey, man, where's your dude at? Is he relieving himself? Like, did he go to the bathroom? Is he sleeping? What's he doing? Where, is your, where are your gods at? And then he turns around and says, check this out. On his altar, 
he lays his animal. It says that they brought buckets and buckets of water and poured it all over the wood to where the, the altar itself was just full of water. So there'd be no doubt that when this catches on fire, who it is. And then Elijah cries out, and God brings fire from heaven. Whoa! And eats up that, that offering like that. It's gone. And then what does he do? Smokes the 452. <laughs> yeah. And you guys are out of here too. Listen, like Elijah, who was calling the nation of Israel out, saying, hey, look, you need to get your stuff together, man. You need to get it together. Stop following all these other gods. Stop doing all these other types of things. John the Baptist was doing the same thing. Yo, I'm out here in the wilderness, and I've got a message for you. Repent. Repent means turn. Turn. Turn from what you're doing. John says, that's what you need to do. He was preparing the way for Jesus to come. Listen. I'm going to close with this. It's not easy to be second. It's not easy to be second. I know people that struggle with being second. Because they want to be number one. They want to be the top dog. They want to, they want to be, it. it's me, I'm the man, I'm the woman, whatever it is. There's something beautiful about being second. It takes humility to be second. It takes humility to be second. I'm in a situation right now with an organization that I work with where I have to back the guy I'm with because that's my job. That's my job. And it's not a popular job. It's not easy being second. But man, if you can learn to humble yourself and, and learn to follow, I tell people all the time, you cannot lead until you learn to follow. It's impossible because you don't understand the principle. You don't understand what it looks like. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, what did he say? That's him. That's the one. I'm out here. You guys are looking at me. This is the dude right here, man. I can't even touch his sandal strap. There's something beautiful when we can live in the shadow of another. So John the Baptist, his ministry was strictly for Jesus. He was the pathway. He was the one who was kind of the town crier calling out. This is him. This is him. This is him. And John was doing what he was supposed to do. He was playing his position. He was staying in his lane. He was telling people to repent. He was baptizing them, and beautiful things were happening. These people that were being baptized, their hearts were being set for Jesus because Jesus is getting ready to appear, and it's going to be a beautiful moment when we look at Jesus being baptized and what that really means and how we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come together in this one act. It's so powerful. Baptism is more than just a demonstration of your faith, church. There's power in baptism. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening and the opportunity to come together and hang out, get some food and fellowship and just a little bit of the word, Lord. And uh, Father, as always, I just pray, God, that um, you know what was said makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, Holy Spirit, that you'd help it to make sense. And Father, if there's questions, Lord, um, I, I pray that people would be freed up to ask those questions. And uh, Father, if they can be answered, they'll be answered. And if not, then I'll do what I can to uh, figure out what the answer is. And uh, thank you, Father, for this building that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the breath in our body. Um, just thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the rain, Lord. We needed it so desperately. And uh, I just pray, God, that you would bring us more. And um, Father, that we would uh, go home tonight and rest and, and let go of our worries and uh, our, our fears and uh, the things that we're battling, God, and that um, we could just rest securely in you. So bless us, God, and we ask this humbly. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all the table said, amen. amen.